Section P one seven S. So this is the ant. So this he bears the ancestral. Well, uh, the the E marker that gives uh way for uh B and A, right? Yes. Yes. You give rise. So we yes. have a, so we have it confirmed that this this is the early E, and then you have the actual mutation of that the E one B one B there. We don't have E one B one A. We got another uh, what is it? another E one B one B one B two. Yes. And you have two C markers because they they say for both of them this could only be assigned to haplogroup CT on basis of mutations of so those are the only mutations that they found for these individuals that those that that are listed they didn't find find the ones where you can identify what you know who exactly they were for what certainly. Certainty. So they can only determine it could have been this based on what they have there. So there's no E one B one A. No. E one B one. There's E one B one B twice. There's two C Ts, but you know, for all we know, they could be. If they were to be something else, I would bank on them be another E one B one B marker, seeing as hey, yeah, look, or, probability. Or, 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 or they can also be half the group T because we have to remember that half the group T. Also played a role in that Middle East as well. You know, yes. they were on the east, they were on the eastern part of the Levant, primarily coming through those um uh, coming through early Iran and early Iraq. So these he, he was around were, during during was it oh, yeah, you find, 12, you 13, find, years ago? So they would have been yeah, you, you find T in the pre paleolithic A B A B and C coast, they're mingled with them. They start to mingle. It's like if you look at it, it's like people are coming from the west, meeting up with people in the east, and later on they're establishing some in the Middle East. Cause it's a zone of confluence, zigzag. Man, we got the dagger squad in the building. We got Black Lion. We got Brother Sabio. Sean was here. Garfield. They watching, baby. <laughs> I got Peace. my little thirteen views. <laughs> got my little thirteen <laughs> views. YouTube gonna send me half a penny. You know Peace. What I'm Peace. Um. So we have their 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 DNA. And my thing is with this whole rapid radiation argument. Why we they've already shown. That they coincide, that E one B one B is co coinciding with, you know, E one B one. I don't know. Even if they found one E one B one A marker, why would they think that is the marker that's gonna be the most prevalent after the Natufians yeah. are gone, and then they make the Canaanites or Israel? This is ridiculous. There's always yeah. something shady, something <laughs> suspicious, some uh, an, a, a, a appeal to conspiracy. I bet you some of these niggas go in their refrigerator and the Kool Aid is half drunk. They gonna think see, the government did it. They want to mm -hmm. stop us from getting our identity. They mm -hmm. came in my refrigerator and drunk my Kool Aid. So, so we have their DNA here, and this fab is. Are they? Are there more? On the Tufian um individuals that that's that's that that have been uh, discovered in goes that, that it's only been five, bro. It's only they only sequence five, literally just five. And we have seven <laughs> Iberian Marusians and they're all E one B one B, and they're yeah. older. Yes, they're older than the Tufians, correct? But we're seeing in Northeast Africa and possibly in Nirvana almost a preponderance. If as far as the E markers, you see in them come out as B. Yes. Okay. Oldest grave, flowers unearthed in Israel. Um, this is eight years old. The Natufian sample consisted of 61.2% Arabian, 21.2% Northern African, 10.9% Western Asian, and 6.8% Omotic ancestry. The transition in Levant from the Epipaleolithic to the Neopaleolithic period involved an increase of Arabian ancestry. Okay, so we see their, their breakdowns of their DNA here. Correct. What was the Sub-Saharan? Oh, that well, that omotic component, but that omotic component is part of the predecessor or the precursor of making way to North Africa, to the North African component. So even those early North Africans had an omotic component. Those omotic populations were partially responsible for a diversion into the northern parts of Africa. Remember that EM, anything that comes from E1B1 or E1B1B, it's highly postulated that E1B1B ultimately developed in that mutation of that clay, the mutation of the late clay developed in the Horn of Africa. And the only base example, a perfect example of these people that just, that had these older forms of E1B1B in the form of E1B1A that's absent of M2 mutations and E1B1B, because you still find them, is those Omotic people, the Omotic people, Akar, the Ari people, the Omotic speakers that still live in Northeast Africa. Primarily in Ethiopia and some parts of Eritrea, they have the diversity of E1B1 in the form of E1B1A 
outside of having the M2 mutation that we have. And they also have other layers. And these are the people that gave rise to EM125. They're not them, not not ultimately them, but I'm just saying as an example, base population example or base example, they gave rise to the EM215, which gave rise to the EM35, which gave rise to the EZ60, EV65, which gave rise to the EM78 with those aberrant erosions and upper Egyptians, and also the EZ827 that went into the Levant and became the EM123. And also a branch of that EZ2 at Z827 became those pastoralists that gave rise to EV15, V15, which went south into Tanzania and brought pastoralism. Okay, let's keep going. Reanalysis of whole genome sequence data from 279 ancient Eurasians. Um, Daniel Schreiner, uh, what it says here, previously no significant sharing of ancestral components with sub-Saharan African populations was found to accompany the presence of white half of group E1, B1, uh, this is B, these are B markers. Um, and they say this one here, um, <clears throat> Z830 is presently common among Berbers in North Africa. Yes. Um, Okay, so they're showing uh, these these E one B one B markers. That Z eight thirty comes from that E Z eight two seven, correct? Mm. Which gave rise to the E M one two three and that late Amazigh or late Berber E M eighty one, which only mutated recently between two thousand and four thousand years ago. That E M eighty one, but that, that went through a, 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 a expand a, 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 um expansion and rapid radiation at a high rate between a recent time period between 2000 to 4000 years with EMA. How long did it take? I mean, the market itself is a leak downstream mutation of for the that. Rapid so radiation it, that she was talking about. I mean, for that mutation itself, so the um, rapid expansion amongst it, it was only 2000 to 4000 years that EM81. And when they dominated, they dominated over those other EM78s of E1B1B that was lingering around since early North Africa. They wasn't dominating over nothing else. Or we don't know what was going on. It could have been a, a, a bottleneck, a reduction of a population. I can't say it's really a founder effect or a, even dealing with a genetic drift because parent groups or para groups of it or brethren groups of it was already lingering around Africa. But we do know that this shit went through a rapid expansion and it dominated. And now it's the highest marker amongst Amazigh or Berbers today, this EM81, which only formed between 2,000 to 4,000 years ago. Okay. And right here you have- This um, mutation. You got the um, uh, the pre-pottery -potter Neolithic A culture developed out of the early local tradition of Natufian in southern Palestine, dwelling in roundhouses and building the first defensive site at uh, Tel El Sukan. That's Jericho from the Bible. Mm -hmm. Guarding a valuable freshwater swing. This was replaced in 7500 BC by pre-pottery Neolithic B, dwelling in the mm -hmm. square houses. That was the E1B1A in the P. Pre no, most, most of the Ain Gazelle and pre pottery Neolithic B was E1, B1, B, uh, H2, and a, and a T marker. But they were highly E1, B1, B, and they were T, and they were H2. Okay. Keep moving. Keep moving because we got more stuff to show. All right. Same thing. The Natufian Sam. Okay. Well, I think my, I might have showed yeah, this. You read that. You showed I that. Read yeah. that about the DNA. Okay. Levantines mm -hmm. and Arabians have different origins. Middle East genomic study finds the Arabians right. have deeper roots in Africa, while the Levantines' roots lie in Europe and Anatolia. In today's is Turkey, they differ in mm -hmm. the amount of Neanderthal DNA as well. So the Natufians were prehistoric people living 11 to 16,000 years ago in Israel, Jordan, and Lebanon. It's possible that they reached Arabia, but their remains haven't been found. Um, also, present day Africans are believed to have a contribution from the Neanderthals after all. Very small, mm -hmm. conferred by early humans who trekked in reverse from Europe back to Africa after mixing with Neanderthals. Would that be those other R1, uh, them chatic kind of? No, 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 no. That portion that they found, which only makes up 0.3%, they found discovered in 2020. The art, it's an article on it where they found Neanderthal and Sub-Saharan. It's only 0.3%. It's small traces. And it could have came from those people that dispersed back in from the Levantine, our, um, the Levantine um, that we spoke of. Um, the Levantine Aurigation population that dispersed back through the Levant. You got to remember, when these Homo sapiens disperse north to could leave out of North Africa, they go into the Levant and some parts of Arabia, they started to meet up with Neanderthal around 50,000 years ago. And it's an article of scientific literature where people can type up um, ancient love child and ancient Israel, Homo sapien Neanderthal 50,000 years ago. So there has been a, a exchange amongst them. And again, these people were the predecessors or precursors of the 
late Emerian culture, which gave rise to the Amerian culture, which gave rise later to the Levantine Argatian Argatian culture in those areas. So that shit came in through those early people that back migrated into the continent. But okay. because they because they mingled with more Homo sapiens sapiens, the Neanderthal component was reduced. And it got more reduced and more reduced. So it went through a genetic receding. As it receded, it went lower and lower into what you see now. And by the time they made it to Western Central Africa, now all you got is traces of it in them. Cool. Let's keep going. So we'll be looking at here. What so, these populations, so, these uh, dark skin? So according to recent studies, the closest population to the Natufians are um, the, Arab, the Southern Arabians, the Bedouin-type Arabs, not modern Arabs. So that's 60... Eight to sixty point sixty five point something percent that they found. Other articles that you're going to bring up that we have is going to say that the sister group to them is the people in Yemen, Socotra, the Emirates, the Emirate area, Omen, those Bedouin groups, and the Mahiri Arabs. And when you look at them, these people are the closest people that has the highest when it comes to autosomal DNA, the highest component of the ancient Natufian component. Uh, component means peace. Uh, it's just it's a piece of, but they have the highest, and they're most more closer to them. And these are not Africans; these are populations of of, of Arabia, which shows the separation of these her early Homo sapien dispersal that dispersed out or linked out. So these people right here that you find these Bedouin group Arabs, that's coming from Yemen, Omen, um, the Kuwait Emirate groups, Omen, uh, Omen. I already brought that up. These are the closest population to the Natufians. Well, we don't do that, and, and, and nobody. Um, well, that goes without saying that, that, that you know, and even paternal half of group E is also amongst a lot of the original uh, Bedouin type Arabs. But go ahead, no, yeah, no, I'm just showing they're definitely people of color. Look at this guy, he's you know, the two fiends they could they definitely were uh, they definitely were able to digest milk, would you say? <laughs> I mean, they were farmers that dibble and dive and hunter gathering and dealing with, um, we got to deal with the pastoralist groups, some of them that dispersed back into the continent. There has been a backflow of early pastoralist groups from North Africa, primarily through the Egypt area, Dakla Oasis, this, before they dispersed into the rest of the continent. So, <laughs> And we're looking at populations close to the Natufis. Okay, let me show you the last image. More people, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. We're gonna breeze through, get through these slides. We got a couple more. The genetic history of the Middle East into Arabia, right? This is from last year by Razib Khan. Modern day South Arabians, in fact, descend in part from indigenous hunter gatherers who were sister clay to the ancestor of Natufians. Ad makes the graph makes clear that for the uh Emiratis with their with the least Af African ancestry, half of their ancestors from this group. Oh, I'm sorry. The admixture graph makes clear makes that clear for the Emiratis. With the least African ancestry, have half their ancestry from this group. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. And why did you 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 included this to show the Arabs have that connection too? Not all Arabs, but the Bedouin type Arabs that Bedouin that most Arabs. of these articles are talking okay, about. Okay, so that's what we were just we were just showing visually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we have the Arab Vedoid here. Yes, and they relate how? Yeah, if you read it, read if you read on there, it'll give you an idea model. These early Vedoids. Oh, yes, it's a little um jumbled. I could try. Let me see. Like type of Arabian Peninsula, South Iran, often heavily mixed. Found in the Maluri of Sound Omar, South Omar, and around Hadramat. That's in Yemen. Okay, this type could be linked to the ancestor Arabian population. As well as the Dravidians in India, okay, okay. Yeah. So when we talk about genetic turnover, because the Natufians are in Israel, they're in Israel tens of ten that over ten thousand years ago, but they're not still there now. We got a white population of, or light fair skin population of of Semitic people, and you know the Hebrews say, well, you know what happened if the E's were there, then they all got kicked out uh you know when uh they got kicked out of israel or whatever that's the that's kind of like the thing or I, at least i've heard some of them say that i won't speak for all of them but i mean the idea is if there's a black people there with e markers and you know even if you don't see e1b one day you see the ancestor you see the brother clay or whatever then it's very possible it could have been there where did they go what happened to them and so history shows a uh, 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 genetic 
turnover, uh, influx of, of of other people coming in? Like, talk to us. Yes. So, so you're gonna get into the chocolate culture. This, this after the the uh, the lipid, um, I'm sorry, the Neolithic phase, you start to get into the chocolate culture, and the chocolate chocolate culture make way for the Bronze Age culture. This is when you start to see an influx of people coming from the Caucasus near Iran and Armenia when they start to disperse over. And the Bronze Age. The E marker that was wandering around and the T marker that was wandering around went through a strong bottleneck, that which is a reduction of a population. So you do find to this day, the Middle East, like Dr. Anthony Jorp or Diop teaches us, or Jorp, the proper word Jorp teaches us, but what we call Diop, teaches us that the Middle East was a zone of confluence. So by the time today, when you look into these populations, you see a phase of human history in the Middle East from the late Pleistocene to the Neolithic phase, to mm -hmm. the Chalcolithic phase, to the Bronze Age, to the Iron Age, to what you see today. And you're usually gonna see haplogroup J from the Bronze Age that dominates earlier stratums of, of, of old vestiges of, of E3B from one and the two fiends that got absorbed in newer populations. You have transcontinental diffusion I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, transcultural diffusion that goes on. Mm -hmm. um, you have all types of things that's going on and found effects, genetic drifts in certain pockets of the area. So they represent a, a zone of confluence. So today, the highest concentration since the Bronze Age has been that J market that's dominated. So by the time you get over there, you're going to see the phase and we're going to read about the phase in history of what went on. Right. So that so there's a, OK, so there's a black population. E markers there. You have other people different markers come in things things change up um and that is the 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 tufians are in what age is that the st late st what's the age is that Stone age? that's the late pleistocene that's 12 late that's pleistocene. yeah that's damn near fifteen thousand years ago Fifteen thousand, yes so now yeah. when it, the 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 beginning of the israelite thing come at the the like the middle of the bronze age israelite well, comes in in the probably the Iron end of the, it, it, the, it's the beginning of Iron Age for sure, but the end of the Middle Bronze Age. But they don't have literature until 800 BC. Right. Okay. So look, I'm, I'm taking, I'm take, I'm taking this. Story. I'm not gonna gaslight them with their text. I take this. Story. I take their word. So okay. Israelites come in Iron Age. Come at the Iron Age. The Bible even, you know, give you that when they start like really coming into their own. Um. I when it comes to the dating of the text, I usually go with I, I take the early date of uh, okay. 1446 BC mm -hmm. as far as the exodus and then they stay yeah. that's in the cool region 40 years so let's just say they come as uh, they come uh um 1400 BC they come around and then they you know the judge period or so we get around to about 1200 BC so the yeah, iron age of them coming into a people yeah so at this time you're going to see even amongst them you're going to see some Leftover E three B amongst them, some J one C three amongst them. You mean you in the region, right? Yeah, in the region, but even amongst the the religion that was created or made by them, you're going to see multiple paternal lines. Biblical symbolically text say mixed multitude, and then it says in one other chapter, thy mother is a the, thy father is an Amorite. They fought thy and thy mother no, thy father is an Amorite. Thy mother is a Hittite. So these are people that will always mingle with the same group populations that's been surrounding those areas for a long time. And even there's even an article about a so-called Yoruba component that was over there 3000 years ago that was inserted over there. But we got to be careful because the Yoruba, that term, again, those nomenclatures, it doesn't mean ultimately Yoruba. Let's not get into that. It's just a sub-Saharan component that, that, that leaked over there 3000 years ago that they found amongst them. So they found them amongst them 3000 years ago. So the Yoruba is just a base population example that that's being used in nomenclature because it features certain affinities to populations of sub-Saharan. So the Yoruba is a base example group that's being used when you hear in scientific terms when it comes to earlier components in the early Sahara and some layers. Well, go ahead. So when I uh, mentioned so Yoruba, Bronze, Yoruba, 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 Yoruba culture, not that old for them to be used. No, in no, no, culture. that's, that's like yeah. a couple, that barely a thousand. Yeah. But yeah, you yeah. have the Bronze Age uh, is when Abraham is existed. See, Abraham is the ancestor. He's coming into Canaan. So he's coming mm -hmm. into a, a, a region. His, he's originally not from Israel. Not really. No. Not from there. He's from, we're going to find out he may be from um, um, uh, Turkey, possibly. Um, so again, as far as the time period is concerned, if I were to just grant them anything and not debate them about the Israel Stella or um, the other one, there's another Stella that says Israel in the 14th century BC in uh, from Egypt. 
So if I were to grant them that in their name, they're pretty much them. They're pretty much Iron Age, and a Abraham is placed pretty much in the second the second millennium BC. So that's the mm -hmm. like the middle or towards the end of the Bronze Age, and we're dealing with mm -hmm. this. The Canaanites walk amongst us. Ancient DNA. This is your boy Razib Khan. Um, toast to him. You know, I just put that picture in there. That wasn't the picture yeah. that was with the article, but that's him. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Having him a nice little drink. Um, the cure. This is what he says. The curious thing that many of these studies are telling us is twofold. Most of the population genetic structure we see around us date to the Bronze Age on the borderland between history and prehistory. I think we can start to set this up as a as a strong prior. It holds true for Near East, Africa, South Asia, Japan, and Southeast Asia. We'll see about core East Asia, but I think probably it is true there too. Selection has continued so that alleles for lactose tolerance and lighter skin have changed in frequency ever since that period. The derived allele for SLC45A2 is found in about two at a two uh, thirds frequency in modern Lebanon, but was absent in these five Sidonians. Though the sample size is small, this was somewhat surprising, and they suggest that they were a swarthier people than modern Lebanese. So they were darker skin, kind of probably mm -hmm. like how the people were showing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he's not talking about Afro Asiatic. And right here, uh, by about two, 2200 BC, the Near East was already quite complex. I believe that the massive Western East. Eastern farmer admixture occurred between 3600 and 3100 during Uruk expansion. The evidence of lower Mesopotamia influence and demographic settlement in places as far as Anatolia, Caucasus, and Syria are well attested from archaeology archeo of this period. Uh, this was a time when a very complex and sophisticated civilization emerged. Okay. Additionally, I'm going down to the bottom here. Buried in this uh, preprint is evidence of major Y chromosome turnover. Mm -hmm. Turnover. Yes, so that means the population is becoming largely uh, what it wasn't, right? Like so you exactly genes right. yeah. and other yes. things coming in. So yeah. during the time, so this is like contemporary to the time Abraham coming, or let's even say before the time he's coming in. The E markers that are there, those black Natufians or people who descended or or, or like them. There's a turn or turnover. Into, they're getting mixed up. They're getting absorbed in newer culture. They're getting, they're getting they, there's things changing. There's transcultural diffusion going on. There's different. They're, they're they're mingling with different groups of people. They're being dominated. They're being absorbed in newer group. That's like me talking about. And this this is no disrespect to my Boricua family because I love them, but um, you can't tell a and that's a, my chair, by the way. But you can't tell a, a Puerto Rican that he's completely Taino or Arawak. Yes, he has components in him at 30, sometimes 30 percent, sometimes 20 percent, sometimes 10 percent. Yeah. But he also has a large genetic uh, affinity to Mediterranean Europeans that he descent from. And sometimes they can range by number, you know, from the lowest to the highest. So, you know, this is what's going on. These people are becoming a new phase of the Middle East. You know, the Bronze Age phase of the Middle East is not the earlier Eurasian phase or that basal Eurasian phase, which is definitely not the earliest paleo Eurasian phase, which is connected to the early North African phase. So these people are, there's a strong population turnover when you get at this Bronze Age phase period. They trolling us in the chat. Y'all playing with us talking about some Hebrew Israelites. Uh, good morning, Rob Masu. Peace to you. So let me read this last person. So we, we see Y chromosomal turnover. We've seen this before. The prominence of haplogroup J in Bronze Age and modern Levantine seem to be due to Eastern farmer migration. In fact, adding haplogroup J and R together, we get the inference that more than half the paternal lineages of Lebanese today are not from Western farmers native to the area. So Correct. Whether you're a yeah. proponent for whatever marker you think the Jews are, that that area, just right before you have an Abraham, is changing with different people in the region. So exactly. we know Abraham comes, whether he, you know, you want to debate whether he exists or not, let's put him there. Because this is so, a, a, really a hypothetical argument. Yes. So if you look at this chart, the Natufians, the sample was five. The pre Neolithic B double sample was seven. The pre um, um C is one, the Bronze Age, and then you have the present-day Lebanese. Now, if you look on the side, you can see the phase. So from the Natufian phase, which is the early late Pleistocene, you find haplogroup C and E. Yeah, it's from down the, here. I know y'all can't see it. It was flipped the yeah. other way. I had to flip it. From the pre pottery Neolithic, you find the H that I talked about. You find the T that I talked about, and you find the C and the E. 
pre pyrenolithic C, extremely C. They only found one in the pre pyrenolithic C. That was CT or C. Bronze Age, look at it. It's J. <laughs> so and then we have an influx of haplogroup J. Yeah, and then a pre present day Lebanese, based off the fossils or what's, I mean, people living today, it's all mixed up. You have all of them. You have, except C, because C don't exist no more, but you have the E, you have the J that's high in the middle, you have the, the L, you have the R, you have the T, and you have E. So that's what's going on in present day Lebanon. <laughs> all right. They troll it in the chat. At least we got them saying something. And this well, is always not he was just laughing about it, the Israelite stuff. Blue-eyed immigrants transformed ancient Israel 6,500 years ago. So that's 4, 4, 4,500 BC. So you have people yeah, yeah, bringing yeah. the blue-eyed genes and a light skin coming in. Yeah, light skin allele. They're mixing with those swathier skin people. It's a turnover. It's, you see the, the change. They're right, starting so to mix. Thousands of years ago, in what is now northern Israel, waves of migrating people from the north and east present-day Iran and Turkey arrived in the region, and this influx of newcomers had a profound effect transforming emerging culture. What's more, they not only brought new culture practices, they introduced new genes, such as the mutation that produces blue eyes that were previously unnown in that area, because you had in the two, they ain't, the two kids ain't have blue eyes. Archaeologic no. archaeologists, I'm sorry, recently discovered this historic population shift I should have highlighted that. So the population shift by analyzing DNA from skeletons preserved in an Israeli cave. The site in, north, uh, in the north of the tiny country contains dozens of burials, more than 600 bodies dating to 6,500 years ago. That's impressive. DNA analysis showed the skeletons preserved in the caves were genetically distinct from people who historically lived in that region. So they found it. So they were able to sequence their genetics? Yes. Some of the genetic differences match those of people who lived in neighboring Anatolia and the Zagros Mountains. Okay, so the ancient Israel belonged to a region known as the Southern Levant, um, which encompasses, encompasses today's Eastern Mediterranean countries. Southern Levant experienced a significant cultural shift during the late Chalcolithic. So that's around four, was it four, five, 4,500 to 3,800? Yeah. Wow. Yes. With denser settlements, more rituals performed in public, and a growing use of osieries and funeral preparations, the research uh, reported. Though some experts had uh, previously proposed that cultural transformation was driven by people who were native to the southern Levant, the authors of the new study suspected that waves of human migration explained human migration explained the changes. To find answers, they turned to a burial site in the Peking Cave, in Upper Galilee. 6,500 years ago, they, and there they we go. Blue eyes and fair skin. <laughs> they found these individuals shared genetic features with people from the north, and those similar genes were absent in farmers who lived in the southern Levant earlier. For example, the allele, one of, one of two or more alternative forms of a gene that is responsible for blue eyes was associated with 49% of the sampled remains. That's about, what, close, that's about close to 300. Suggesting Correct. that blue eyes had become common in people living up in Galilee. Another yep. allele hinted that fair skin may have been widespread in the lo local population as well. Oh, wow. That's right. So prior to Abraham coming in, they're getting blue eyes and fair skin there. <laughs> Both eye and skin color are traits that are controlled by complex interactions between multiple alleles, many, but not all, which have been identified. Okay. All right. And they quote the guy talking about that. So let me keep moving. And this is this is another one. Ancient DNA from Chalcolithic Israel reveals the role of population mixture in tr culture transformation. Right. So they, they took 22 individuals from Peking Cave. Uh, they were part of a homogenous population. Um, Peking P Cave population also appeared to have contributed differently to later Bronze Age groups. See. So, so this is OK. And they found it, the 200 Ozearies, domestic jars, okay, 600 individuals. They radiocarbon dated it. So it was the cal it was radiocarbon uh, dated to the uh, Catholic, late Catholic. That's right. That's right. Okay. And right here, it's more about the mixing. By the Bronze Age, however, expansion of different Near Eastern agriculturalist populations, Anatolian, Iranian, and Levantine, in all directions, an admixture with each other 
substantially homogenized populations across the region, thereby contributing to the relatively low genetic differentiation that prevails today. So it shows that the Levant Bronze Age population from the site of Ain Ghazal, Jordan, could mm -hmm. be statistically as a mixture of around 56% ancestry from a group related to Levantine pre-pottery Neolithic agricultures um, and 44% related to population of the Iranian Calcolithic. That's right. Hmm. So they, they, there's, there's a, this is discussing the uh, population changing. So they, they pretty much all mixed up. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. I'll just keep moving. Get into Abraham real quick. <laughs> yeah, that's a good model of, of what, you know, you know, if, if people believe in a, in a figure, you know, some some of these people were swarthy, some of these people were light, you know, some of these people had skin color doesn't determine like you have people darkest continents with Africa. That doesn't mean that they're from the continent. People been outside the continent for a long so time. So a lot of Cold a lot of mixing. So Abraham not even wasn't even there yet, but when he get there, scholars usually place him in the late um like in the early, like around around two thousand something, they might some people are generous. They give him twenty four, they give him twenty two, they give him twenty three. He's usually around this time, these time periods. And then when you look at looking outside of the biblical text, he could have been as late as the sixteenth, seventeenth century. If you and this story kind of, and some people believe the story match up with a dreamy of a locker, but that's a different story. Yeah. So the Bronze Age, and this, this is this is just archaeology in Israel, the wiki page. They're saying the Bronze Age for Israel is 3300 to 1200 BC when objects uh, made of bronze were used. So, mm -hmm. so uh, one of the things that um, I guess a lot of them do, because I guess there's a culture in Turkey that may host e-markers or whatever, they deal with the with, with this with this thing with Abraham his origins uh possibly lying in turkey but i think a lot of people starting to change to, to subscribe to this now that that uh ur is not uh southern iraq it's actually a, a, a lo another location in um turkey and i think Sa mm -hmm. sabio was just saying uh he's a turk uh -huh. sabio was just joking in the chat to say abraham was a turk but you might be right <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and this is the bible right here genesis 11 27 32 right they set out from Ur to Chaldees to go to Canaan, but then they came to Haran and they settled there. And then Canaan died. I mean, I'm sorry, Terah died. He was 205, right? I totally, I'm not a subscriber to you being 205 at a time when you ain't got no medical care and people dying of two fakes. But uh -huh. I just went to this, or there was multiple articles, but I just went here. I just wanted to give people um, a quick idea of the argument about um, Ur. So, where is Ur, um, Abraham's birthplace? Ur Kasdim is know, generally identified. You good? Yeah, no, go ahead and read. One second, bro. I'm here. All right. So Ur is uh, generally identified with the uh, Sumerian city Ur in uh, southern Iraq. And yet a look at geography in Genesis 11 points to a different location uh, farther north. I don't know why I'm talking like I'm from Baltimore today. Abraham's departure from Ur. Okay. The scene in which Abraham is first introduced to the reader, a genealogical record about his father, Terah, tells us the name of his hometown. So here's here Terah, the father, Ur Kazdim, Ur of the Chaldees. After a brief notice about Abram and Nahor's marriage, the text, without offering a reason, explains that he moved his family out of Ur. So he took his son, Lot, and they went out. Uh, with them from uh, Ur Kazdim to go to Canaan until they came to Haran and they dwelt there. The name of his hometown is mentioned again in the opening of the covenant. I am Yahweh who brought you forth from Ur of Kazdim to the to uh, give you this land of Canaan. The claim is echoed in the prayer recited by the Levites in the book of Nehemiah, part of which is recited in the Jewish daily morning prayers. So, all right. Again, the text credits Abraham's leaving Ur of Kazdim to God. So basically, the Bible, you know, the, it's, it's acknowledging what the Bible says that he came from Ur Kazdim. And I just skipped down to this part where they talk about what a, you know, the alternative to southern Iraq, right? Um, one scholar, matter of fact, let me keep, let me, um, let me go back here. 
So I guess they in this article they talk about how there's a um there's a Haran in Turkey, right? Right down here it says Haran is a city in southeastern Turkey, 16 kilometers north of the Turkish Syrian border. It's still called by that name today. It's well known from cuneiform sources. Uh hold up and goes. I don't want to do the let me put you in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you see my screen again? Yep, I can see you can. Go ahead. So they're talking about uh, Haran in Turkey, um, and, they, and they say, they mentioned it is in cuneiform sources, both Ebalite and Akkadian, reaching back to the third millennium BC and continuing through the second and first uh, millennium BC. But where is Ur Kasdan? So I just skipped down here because they made a whole argument uh, um, about uh, about um, Ur. The most common identification of Ur is uh the great city of ur in southern mesopotamia uh this is tel el mukayar in southern iraq um mm -hmm. it flourished during sumerian times it was identified first by henry c rawlingson but leonard woolley was the first who established who established it as standard doctrine so he's the one who got everybody going on with the southern mesopotamia as as where he came from he excavated, he assumed, given the spirit of the time, including an effort to uncover the connections that Abraham must have come from as great a city as Ur of Sumer. So yeah. um, it fit the Ur of Chaldeans. We know that the Chaldeans were indeed residents in southern Mesopotamia during the first millennium BC. And in fact, the terms Babylonian Chaldea become virtually interchangeable. Mm -hmm. So the identification of his birthplace with Ur of Sumer in southern Iraq is standard teaching presence so even the vatican tried to you know talked about it but they, this article disputes that they said that there are several problems with it and they go to it so the issues what it was uh the mention of beyond the river in the text the location of haran the location of haran and the chaldeans and i don't want to get too bogged down by that so um this is the name of the article if y'all want to see the argument there's another one called have we aired on earth but um, yeah, they they actually go, you know, they actually seem to be entertaining that Abraham could have actually came from Turkey and not from southern um, southern Iraq. So Erfer in Turkey, one scholar who noticed who noted the problems and disagreed with Woolley's identification was Cyrus Gordon. Now I know Cyrus Gordon for some pseudo stuff, but he could be right about this. Although Gordon dug with Woolley at Ur in the 1930s, he could not accept the great archaeologist's conclusion. Instead, he noted that a Terra and family left Ur to travel to Canaan, but stopped en route in Haran. Then the location of Ur could should be to the north of Haran. Considering these data points, a more uh, attractive suggestion is that Abraham's hometown is the city of Ur in northern Mesopotamia, modern-day Urfa in southeastern Turkey. And this is north. This is north of Haran. Most likely, this city is the one mentioned as Ura and cuneiform tablets from Ugarit. So, basically, um, in Gozi, um, they uh, scholars recently are associating um, Abraham's origin as being in uh, as going in Turkey, as being in Turkey or whatever, coming from Turkey. Correct. So. What is the significance for Hebrews who uh, have that um, convenience? Is, is there well, any connection where they can well, try to say, well, the E markers well, were in Turkey? Well, 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 there were there were E markers there because the pre Neolithic B culture migrated in that area to, through northern Syria. Then they was went into southern Turkey, and the pre Neolithic B also gave rise partially to the Gobekli Tempe structures that you find. But the problem with that though is that. That's the pre That's not the Bronze Age. By the Bronze Age, a lot of people were already mixing in that area. Even if you look at near like Iran, a culture in the Iron Age, the um, Oaxis BMAC culture that they try to use. And if you read articles about the BMAC culture, it said that they had different ethnic groups. So they found one E1B1A, one E1B1B. If you want to base it off haplogroups, groups, they said there was different ethnic groups in that region. Again, it wasn't exclusively E anything. The rest of the markers was highly j g r um, um, um also um l it was all types of markers there so people some hebrews is trying to hold on to that because they know that the pre neolithic b had a presence there and not to mention that we do know that a form of um semitic does come from um proto-semitic speakers according to christopher Eric, 
which leaked out. They were part of the Harifian culture that had E3B. So we got to be careful with that. So. Okay, so back convenience that they, they can try to say, well, he's from there. We look, look we, we can find some markers here. And they're going to stretch that to say, well, Abraham yeah. could have been that. Yes. Yes. That's that's a heavily flawed argument. Um, but nonetheless, this is the kind of stuff we see to piece and, and thread their argument together like like that much. I mean, why not just convert to Judaism? I mean, look, if you're somebody, because there's you know, some of them Hebrews that you was t- telling me about, they're willing to even say, well, you know, you can't just take the Bible narrative. You have to deal with, you know, what the history say. But I'm like, well, without the biblical narrative, what's the incentive to become a Hebrew? Oh, wait. Goes, he coming back on. You know, my yeah. question to you no, is, if you've talked to Hebrews who would say, well, the Bible, we don't have to go back a biblical story or believe it in totality, uh, as you told me, um, then even if you go back science, even if y'all could show yourself being descendants of these people, because I know who, whatever Hebrew listening, I'm like, who, which Hebrew said that? Oh, there's definitely mm-hmm. some Hebrews that we encountered that that's willing to say, well, you know, you go, you just going off what the Bible say. You got to deal with history. You got to have a methodology. Well, mm-hmm. the Bible, the Bible should be enough for y'all. Should be enough. It should be a belief or whatever. But my question is. If you are these people genetically and the Bible isn't real or it's not what you thought it was or it's only part true or it's not supernatural, then what is the incentive to become a Hebrew? Because a lot of these people, and not all, but there's a lot of them, like the campers, they have a vested interest in uh, redemption. Like they believe, of course, they're going to put people in slavery uh when the messiah come back or do you just have moderates that just think they'll be light servants or they just won't get in or whatever Mm -hmm. nuanced views they have i'm just saying what if this stuff ain't true and you a jew and in the world the world is not what your theology um presupposes then then what i mean you just want the clout you want the you want the to be able to take the land back and Tell the Jews, the other Jews, they fake or something like that. I always ask. I ask the same questions with the the abos. Okay, we're not African. Let's take your argument. But now what? You've been overpopulated and dominated on your land. White people mm-hmm. ain't leaving just because you now found out you're an Indian. Now you got to live amongst them. And now you got to ask mm-hmm. them for stuff and they can still say no. Mm-hmm. So I know. I don't know, man. I ask those questions. I don't know. So if Abraham I mean, did come from Turkey, they could argue what for pre pre pottery Neolithic B, which would indicate yeah, and, and that doesn't make sense. That shit is way before the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, so it doesn't it doesn't it, it wouldn't make sense. And not to mention the pre pottery Neolithic B, even at this time period, wasn't all E. You know they disregarded that T and that H that was there. They only found seven fossils, so you don't know what the fuck was amongst the rest of them. You know, they look at these the specimens that they find and, and what's been sequenced from the specimens or, or, or fossils that they've been finding. That's not the overall population. And you can't say because somebody found 10 fossils here that this is the overall population. You don't know what the fuck they'll find next week or tomorrow, which is problematic, which puts it all in a postulated state. They all postulate playing games. So, and and y'all, give some likes. y'all give me some likes. Sorry, the problem y'all give me some the, likes. With the postulation thing is it's OK for you to postulate here. But when somebody else postulate, they wrong. But you're basing your things off of belief, which is highly postulation, highly belief. You don't even have the facts on it. But you, but when you find a gap in the area, it's okay for you to do it, but the next person can't do it. No, it's all the same shit, yo. So what I'm saying is we can't say that, you know, fossils is the overall population if they haven't sequenced them all. That's a problem. But what we have for now, based off the studies now, the pre party Neolithic B wasn't all haplo E3B or, or subclades of mutation E. And also, they wasn't. Um, they were prior before the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. So there has been a lot of changes that went on, especially in Iran and Anatolia, with other groups of people starting to dominate before, especially in the Chalcolithic phase and the Chal- Chalcolithic culture. All right, let me keep moving. Long-awaited landscape. Okay, we we used this already with the hostas, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, now we get towards the end. Give me one second. Hold up. Swig of water, real quick. All right, 
So now we're getting into African-American paternal DNA. We've looked at the Natufian DNA. We looked at uh, Iberia Marusian DNA. You mentioned BMAC, pre-pottery Neolithic B. So what about the homies and the thugs and the fellas that I get to see when I walk down the street? <laughs> What's they did? <laughs> so, um, so, uh, oh man, let me see. Do I have this in order here? So they did this test. This is this is an older study. I asked him goes. He said it was fine. This is from around like 07, right? So they used 243 unrelated individuals, uh, 118 African Americans, 125 European Americans. Um, they used uh, whole blood or buccal swabs. This is what I'm used to the um, the um, saliva swabs for them. So let me uh, let me go. What did I start? I didn't start from the beginning. Um, but I did note, I guess I did want to note that uh, they, they were talking about the um, R1B derived haplogroups. Ten of the markers define seven new subclades equivalent to E3A, 7A. Uh, they talk about the E's. And then you get R1B, 3H. I thought it was interesting that they have um, sub R1B3 marker rarely used and found that this haplogroup in effect defines the YSTR Irish modal haplotype. I've never heard of that. That's so funny to me. You know, you heard of the, the Cohen modal um, haplotype, but that's the Irish modal haplotype. If you're going to find out, some of you brothers got the Irish modal haplotype, yo. Shiver me. No, that ain't, that ain't it. Top of the morning to you. And the, this <laughs> um this um paper is subpopulations with the majority with the major European and African derived haplogroups R1B and E3A are differentiated by previously previously phy phylogenetically undefined. Why do y'all really talk like this? People who who, who study genetics. Yeah, I, I bet you y'all got. I bet you y'all can lift weights with y'all tongues or something as much as y'all got to <laughs> pronounce all these words. Who the heck speaks like this? I rebuke. <laughs> what the hell wrong with y'all? So yeah, they did buccal swabs to do this test. Um, so basically, I just wanted to show as far as this this test. This was in two thousand six or seven, and Gozi said it was cool to use because I couldn't find nothing um as recent. You know, um, they they saying in our population, sixty percent of African Americans belong to half the group E three A. Um. Which is very interesting because I thought it would be more, but they're saying sixty percent. That's just that's just more than half, and I'm like, wow, because um, the significance of having a large amount of of African paternal DNA tells you something about your population. With all of these people that were impacted by white supremacists and racism elsewhere, you have people in Sudan who have man have what percentage what would you say in gozi 40 to 60 percent j um in northern sudan it depends some 40 to 60 percent happy group j they 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 hit them so that means that their <laughs> fathers are non non they're not the uh, not originally of those people because we know the people well, well, they were well, a, well, go ahead you know they were a b and some e em seven eight but here's the thing um haplogroups groups again doesn't determine who you are so yeah Deep somewhere down the line, a deep ancestry paternal lineage goes back to the Raven Peninsula. But those, a lot of those people are out of Somali overall. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, no I'm, doubt. You probably mm -hmm. wouldn't even tell by just looking at them. But my point yeah. is the only reason I'm bringing this up, big bro, is the is because when you have, um, when you're under dominion of, of yes. white people, we want the dominion of, 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 of white people. White supremacy. When, when, Correct. When, when 60 to 50, 60% 60 of your population is of your oppressors or a foreign extraction, that means two mm -hmm. things, and they both really point to the same thing. That yes. means you are being forcibly taken or yes. sexual selection is for yes. non-indigenous, uh, non-male yes. uh, non yes. lineage. That yes. means the women yes. are choosing because when a man in, in society, when men are dominant, when your uh, men are dominant, the females mm -hmm. are usually hypergamous and they usually want to be with the dominant men for protection. It's, it's just biological. Correct. So the, mm -hmm. it, it, you, it explains the behavior. If you're getting dominated, they're going to go to your, you're going to go to your oppressor yeah. for what you need and they're going to have access to your women. Now, the fact that we are 60% and I think probably higher or just six, let's say 60%, it proves the resilience of African-Americans here. Like we could have been 40%, could have been 30. You know what I'm yeah. saying? 
And this yeah. was in 2007. I don't know if it's gone up. I don't know where, where it is. However, I will also say um, there probably is, you know, a, probably a small amount, maybe what, 5% of people that might have E1, B1, B. Uh, it probably probably a small percent, but it's just like or a or, or a lineages, like they might be like three, four, three to five percent. Yeah, but I I think we got a higher chance of finding a than E three B. But E three B has been found amongst some African Americans, but it's low compared to a. You have a higher chance of finding a, like you know you you're a. You know people wouldn't expect that. You know what I'm saying? But you represent an old lineage within the continent of Africa. Right, and right, it's still right. right. I, heard, so, yeah. I heard that it, that they, they have close to 10 percent i'm not sure but that is I definitely believe that yeah, yeah, seven yeah, yeah. to ten percent is a fact so 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 don't get me wrong audience i'm not saying that only we're only 60 percent. i'm saying there's other lineages other than e1 b1 a that are african yes. like e, e3b a that could you know if you want to take total african ancestry that might get you back up to 70 80 percent but you know yeah go ahead. i was gonna say but you know some of these black americans with e3b because you do have them, you know, you know who I'm talking about, who got the E3B. Some of this shit comes from Eastern Europeans, from an Eastern oh, yeah. European, European or even a Spaniard great great grandfather. That's true, because yeah. you have they, <laughs> you have their variety of um, um E. So you have yeah. the EV13 that developed in the Balkans around 13,000 years ago that was already over there. Then you have the Berbers who went into Spain, who left EM81 among some Spanish men. You also find clades of uh of, of of em123 that dispersed all the way from the natufians that dispersed with those anatolian firms that went all the way through you know the mediterranean into eastern europe and the mediterranean and you find some of these people with great 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 grandfathers that come from eastern europe or the mediterranean that gives them mm -hmm. traces of e3b so you know so it, you it's have, tricky with e3B. yeah because you know the rap the rapper nas he's uh was was he he's, i he, he's i it's shit linked my to man the Nas, one of my favorite rappers he talk all that pro black and this dude daddy is thor Jesus Christ. <laughs> Martin Luther King was uh what was he? He had an Irish half and Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey as well. Marcus Garvey as Alpha well. Max mm -hmm. and Mark and it, yeah, like like Mika said, it don't make you who you are, but it, it does tell you something about some things. It's funny because Martin Luther King <laughs> his daddy was a European <laughs> and he fought to get us to be around Europeans. <laughs> and Marcus Garvey tried to get away from Europeans. <laughs> so crazy, the, bro. The, same, the same paper I cited right here, um, 46% of European Americans, I guess here in America, 46 of them in America, and 14% of us belong to R R1B3 as defined yeah. by M269, that's Cruciani, that's 2002, more. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I don't know if they have an updated 2020 or 2019 or what it's going to mm -hmm. say. It could say, could say, because uh, the European could go up for them, and then it could go up for us, or it could decrease. Um, In my opinion, I think it could have went up probably. Two it went up. I There's probably a went lot up, yeah. of mixing. I, I, white, white, yeah. <laughs> white girls got thick in the last 10 years, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're gonna get me they're gonna get me oh, no, but i'm just saying so so the off top for anybody who does the the, the paternal lineage that tells you that 14 percent of african americans definitely ain't, ain't, ain't israelite if we were to play your game yeah. <laughs> but we know that we i argue that virtually if there were any there would probably be 14 percent or less yeah <clears throat> but yeah this is just interesting going out and going in the idna um and this is the um this is the uh chart associated with that and we're pretty much done here um i think i asked you about rap <laughs> yeah you asked rap me about yeah you asked me about it absolutely or whatever so if anybody yeah. got some questions let me see it was a fun this was fun i don't know how do you this was fun drop the link in the um in the how do you drop the link in the chat? Well, I know that we did an excellent. This was an excellent, excellent presentation. Um, it was great, and um, I hope the people enjoyed it. Oh uh, man, I hope uh, I'm glad, man. I'm glad to have gotten through this, dude. This was this was. This was <laughs> I'm gonna see. Is there any? Let me. See, I'm gonna see if there's any way for me to drop the link, or if not, I ask y'all to ask questions, and if not, then I'll just you know let y'all go. Uh, how do you drop a link? In the chat, let's see. Oh man, mute myself. New pinned chat. Got it. 
okay let me see if i can drop our link up in here so we got the the fellas there we got black lions uh supreme that's their sabio i don't know how often you get to talk to these fellas and goes <clears throat> see uh if y'all do copy and paste thank you mika wow this is cool when you when you're the one doing it man this is cool i should have started <laughs> doing this stuff sooner garfield i'm used to watching garfield you know oh yeah but, uh, but we gonna we definitely gonna have more conversations in the future with ngozi and with anybody else and stuff like that um hopefully the topics be fruitful I don't, i'm not a really a hater of clout chase i'm not chasing around hebrews to just start debunking but i will debunk claims because they claims well i think that we did a, a excellent job i think people believe should be their belief but to be cultish and form these cults and force your views on people and try to belittle people is a problem we got to stop that so it is what it is <clears throat> yeah um let me see what Savio said. Abraham is from Turkey. We are not from Turkey. Game over, you turncoats. Uh, yeah, I like that. Let me say, West Africans have the wrong phenotype for having lived in West Asia. They would have been thinner and longer noses with smaller nostrils if they came from where Abraham was from. They are adapted for heat. Absolutely. Mm. I think what's important to take from this stuff is... um. Arguments, I mean, look, when you have people who really want it, they, they will really work for like they really like derived the way, like to contrive the way to argue. And I mean, we were now, I guess it is our fault because we was asking them to use DNA. <laughs> we were we said, like, Y'all need to start, y'all need to start using uh real yeah, sciences dude. and DNA. They go black lion. Peace, black lion. Good morning. Hotel, hotel fam. What's up, uh, brother? You know, what's happening? You know how to come mm -hmm. pay my respects to the great and gozy. My, Peace, my, King. Uh, my uh, uh, my master teacher in DNA. Peace, fam. Peace, King. So how I, you doing? Oh, I'm doing good, bro. You know how you get down, man. You know I love it. So I always Appreciate anytime you. I see your name going live, I'm I'm in the, I'm in the building. That's for sure. Well, I Taking appreciate notes. you. Too. I appreciate no you, man. You got any questions, yeah. comments, anything you want to say? You not, say? not really, because the you know you guys covered it all. I just came to pay my respects. It's not really uh, any questions I really have, um, other than to say that uh, I still have not seen any evidence of our people claiming Israelite before the Jim Crow era. Oh, and, wow. Uh, you going to go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. What about, the Zod, what about the Zod dynasty? You don't get, you don't, you don't um, give no credence to that? No, because I don't see any primary evidence to support it. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, so, yeah, so. Uh, and every time I hear my brother Ngozi uh, speak on this, he just proves my point <laughs> more and more. You know, <laughs> so it is what it is. But yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, fam. I appreciate you. I appreciate, I appreciate you both. You, you already know. know. Peace, thanks King. Thank you. You know, we got the squad out. I I'm always happy to you see that Black Lion is the man. Um, I'm gonna get to you. I'm gonna get to you, Sabi. I want to talk to culture, coffee, cannabis. How you doing? Good morning. Hey, peace, 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 peace. How y'all doing today? Peace, peace. Hotel, oh, hotel. I, I'm just curious. Um, and I was watching the show. This guy went ahead and subscribed and clicked the bell. I appreciate for the beautiful information y'all presented today. But I'm just curious, uh, Mr. Amir and Mr. Uh, Avarice, um, why do y'all deny? Y'all Hebrew heritage. I'm not a Hebrew. I'm an African American Creole. That DNA <laughs> stuff is fake, brother. How, how that, why do fake? you deny that you're wrong? Uh, he, he, he 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 That's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> I knew he was joking. Like joking. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> oh, that's, that's my nah, I just want to say peace. Appreciate the info y'all brought out. I mean, anytime, um, anytime the discussion comes up with the dna um and we're able to see um how we're able to see how things changed over time we're able to see the origins of certain ethnic groups um yes. i think that's important especially in this conversation so i just want to appreciate both of y'all brothers and give y'all y'all flowers while i can 
why everybody here. You feel me? Well, let me Thank give you, you yours, man. You used to be you. You was down with the with the um the Hebrew Center thing up there in Atlanta, man. And um, you came a long way. And and man, y'all be building. I love y'all. Um, man, I can't believe y'all came on here, man. <laughs> of course, we're we gonna support, support you, man. bro. What do you mean? We're gonna support you all the time. The Dagger Squad is here, man. The Dagger Squad is here. Let me love. talk to Savio, man. Now listen, um, um, and Savio, he done, he done, a, he done a good amount of research on Turkey, so it was right up his alley. Come on, talk oh, I'm to glad. Me. Yes, sir. What, what, what you got there, King? What up with y'all? What up with Ngozi? Long time, bro. Peace, my brother. How you doing? Peace and love. Oh man, I'm good. Uh, first, I want to say ninety three. And y'all just killed this shit. Y'all put them uh, brothers to bed. Um, and me studying the uh, the turkey area and all that, it's just happened. It's just something that I felt like needed to be done because what happened after 1453, you know, I think is very crucial to to what led up 